Portland is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Edwards, you mentioned uh, uh, to Ms. Waters that uh, uh, you were making these in smaller amounts. Uh, the smallest amount I have seen is $101 million. Is that a small amount to you? It is because the size of these transactions, again, in terms of what what a potential investor would have to contribute, um, it, it, again, that's the book value perhaps of the transaction. But in terms of the actual cash contribution that somebody would have to put up, um, we have we have not found the, the, this. Well, that's okay. Yeah. I, that's just what I wanted you to tell. Uh, the, the smallest one so far I've seen is a hundred million. Now there was one made to a realty group that if you divide the number of assets into the amount, it came up to about $50,000 per asset. Couldn't you have divided those up into smaller uh, things where more people could want to get in on this deal where they pay eight cents down and then you loan them the balance at 0% interest for 7 to 10 years with no recourse? Well, don't you think people would be interested in that? Yeah, I, I um, again, maybe I should talk first about the 8 cents. Um, the loans that um, uh, the Rialto ended up uh, purchasing, the equity partnership, they had a book value of $3.1 billion. The mm -hmm. estimated market value, the implied value based on their bid was about $1.2 billion. Mm -hmm. 90, was that, did that, yeah. Who did that estimate come from? We had a financial advisor that gave us. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank, who is your financial advisor? We have a, a range of financial advisors, such people as um, Barclays, Stiffel Nicholas. I can get you a list. So you're the FDIC, and you don't have anybody that can advise you on the finances? Uh, no, I, 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 I think that our position. Okay, so they're all outside financial advisors. Correct. Now. You said that the uh, uh, inspector general was doing a good job. Yes. I mean, do you think he's doing it appropriately? I, I have all the respect, uh, professional respect in the world for John. You can read his background. I think he's got a very uh, okay. Would well, yeah. you realize that your partner in this deal said that the inspector general was being invasive? I do you know. agree with that? Uh, I, I don't agree with it, and I'm not aware that comment was ever made. Okay. Now, can you give me, and not right now, but just in writing, give me an example of where you went in to some unfinished homes mm -hmm. and worked it out with the borrower to finish those homes up. I want to know where those are at because I don't know of any of them, and in fact, People have had a terrible time even getting in touch with somebody about the FDIC, and the FDIC said, we're not a bank, we don't do that, so I'd like to know exactly where those are. But, Mr. Miller, in your testimony, you say that the barbell you deal with are advised by counsel at every point in the negotiations. Is that correct? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they are, sir. However, uh, we have heard that uh, from the different people that Rialto's pre-negotiation letter sent to borrowers includes a clause that prevents the borrower from bringing legal counsel to negotiations. In fact, I have heard reports that Rialto will not engage with borrowers who have counsel present. Is this the open process that you are claiming that you're holding up as a model? No, sir, and thank you for your question. Um, and as you know, we've talked about this uh, before. Um, uh, it is very much our policy to engage in conversation and communication with our borrowers. And while I respect and understand that, that you might have heard one side of the story, I've always found that any time I hear one side of the story, uh, it's always very compelling. I know, and I heard your side, and that's the reason I went to get another side. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but, um, but the reality is, from the pre-negotiation letter all the way through to every negotiation that we have with our borrowers, um, we engage borrowers with counsel, without counsel. Okay. We try to engage uh, our borrowers properly and respectfully. And um, 
And so I think, if I brought you a pre-negotiation letter that was sent to a borrower that said that they were not allowed to have an attorney, you would you would find that troubling to you? Uh, I'm not sure of the context of that letter, so I won't speak hypothetically. What I would say is that in all instances, any communication with borrowers starts at point A and is subject to discussion and negotiation. Okay, but if so I brought, if a, borrower, you, if I brought me, a letter if, from if the Rialto, borrower would like to have an attorney present, the borrower can speak to us and say, I would like to have an attorney present, and I'd like that as part just, of my written record. I'm just asking you if you would look at a notification from Rialto to a borrower telling them that they could not have counsel during the negotiations. Sir, I would, look at a, I would certainly look at a communication. Yes, sir. Now, what percentage of your negotiators are attorneys? Um... I, I, would, I would have to get back with a real number, but I would say probably uh, 30%. Okay. So it's possible that somebody not being represented by counsel was actually negotiating with an attorney. Is that possible? Um, I, would, I would venture to say probably not. Okay. Uh, we, we generally do not. I, I, I can't speak absolutely, but I believe not. Mr. Edwards, the last time we spoke uh, on the record, which I think was August 2011, yes, sir. Uh, on structured transactions, uh, I asked you if it would be best for a managing partner to go to court and obtain a judgment and allow the borrower to be continue to accrue the interest in the taxes rather than foreclosing and taking the collateral first. Your response was that it seemed to be a case-specific situation. Do you remember that conversation? Yes, that we I do. Think of? So my office sent you case after case to prove our claim that Rialto specifically is litigating over negotiating. However, your answers are the equivalent of giving me and this Congress mm -hmm. the finger. In your letter to Mr. Scott Leventhal, who will testify later, and I hope that all three of you gentlemen will, will stay tuned and hear some of the other side of the story, um, dated March 27, 2002, you said the FDIC states, although the FDIC holds an equity interest in the LLC, such as Rialto, we do not manage or service the assets that were conveyed to the LLCs or Rialto itself. Therefore, the FDIC is not in a position to control a resolution strategy to loans owned by the LLC. So you're saying that even though you're a 60% partner in the deal, that you have fronted $642 million, that you have no say-so in it? Uh, the, the, uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I think, you know, we do exercise an oversight responsibility, but if you look at how and why we put these transactions together, it was specifically to make use of the private sex sector's expertise in working out these credits. It would not be a true sale if, in fact, we were involved in the day-to-day -day management of the LLC. And in fact, that's exactly why we created these transactions, is so that the government was not involved in the day-to-day -day aspects of those transactions. Are we going to do another Sorry. round, Mr. Chairman? Right. We're going to try. I yield, I yield back since my time's up. Okay, thank you for yielding back. Uh, 